Hi, my name is Dr. Kriya Jamra, and I am a social medical scientist in the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior at UB. My research broadly aims to understand the multi-level and intersectional determinants of health disparities among racial, sexual, and gender minorities, including how historical and social structural factors such as racism, violence, and criminalization shape disease outcomes among marginalized groups. My current research examines how experiences of gender-based violence impact alcohol use among trans people and cis women in the Bay Area and how intersectional stressors impact mental health and HIV treatment outcomes among sexual and gender minorities in Ghana, West Africa. So why do I think this topic of violence was chosen for National Public Health Week? Well, the United States is home to pervasive violence um, with various violence outcomes reaching epidemic proportions and reflecting significant um, disparities um, in outcomes, including racial and ethnic disparities and disparities related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Some of the forms of violence highlighted uh, under this theme include gender-based violence, police violence, sexual violence, and domestic violence. I wanted to talk about just a few statistics just to highlight the scale of the problem. In the United States, over 1,000 people are killed yearly by the police, with Black people three times more likely to be killed than white people. Mass shootings have nearly doubled since 2018, with 647 shootings reported in 2022. Um, And as of February of this year, about 95 reported so far. Among um, undergraduate students and talking about college campuses like our own, about 26% of females and 7% of males experience rape and sexual assault. And of course, we need more data on how um, LGBTQ students also experience these forms of violence. And in terms of intimate partner violence, one in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of intimate partner violence. Um, And we see disparities um, related to race um, when it comes to these statistics, with 45% of Black women and 40% of Black men um, reporting experience in intimate partner violence. For lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals, um, they experience violence at rates higher than straight counterparts. My own research uh, with my colleagues at San Francisco Department of Health found that one in two trans women in the San Francisco Bay Area have experienced transphobic hate crimes with Black and Latinx trans women more likely to experience deadly forms of violence, such as assault by um, a weapon. So these statistics paint a particular picture, which is that there are multiple crises related to violence across the country um, and across different social groups that reflect and exacerbate existing social inequities. So what is one thing I want people to know about this topic, given uh, the realities that I just described? I think a key takeaway from this topic is that violence is so pervasive and normalized in this country that it is actually not publicly understood as a key predictor of adverse negative health outcomes. It is just seen as what is, what happens in this country, on another mass shooting, here we go again. However, Violence is linked to adverse health outcomes. It is both an outcome of social inequalities, but also a producer of more uh, social inequalities, right? Um, And because of that, it is a key public health issue that is in need of redress. Um, So violence is a historical and social structurally produced problem, one that does not only manifest in direct and behavioral ways that we are accustomed to talking about, such as, let's say, physical or sexual violence an individual might experience from another individual. But it is also um, something that is experienced in distal and indirect ways as well, right? We often talk about behavioral violence, such as mass shootings, but less about structural violence. And structural violence, I want to focus on here, structural violence. Structural violence is a term coined by Norwegian sociologists, Johan Galtung and liberation theologians, Uh, decades ago um, that described ways that our social structures, such as the economy, our laws, the political system, religious institutions and ideology, and so other social cultural factors prevent individuals, groups, and societies from meeting their basic needs and reaching their full potential. And usually it is the most marginalized among us that are kept from meeting their full um, capacity and their full needs because of these forms of structural violence. So, for example, we talk a lot about individual mass shooters, individual forms of violence, et cetera, but little conversation, we have little conversation about the political climate, which encourages and normalizes such violence. Now, I want to pause here and focus on 
the ongoing backlash and attacks against transgender people across the country as an example of, of this, of this structural violence. Over the past few years, we've witnessed over 400 anti-LGBTQ bills um, introduced across the country and 15 anti-trans bills specifically that have been passed into law. These attempts at successes in criminalization is just an example of the structural violence that then caused marginalized people like transgender, transgender individuals to experience shortened life um, outcomes, physical violence, including murder, and blocked access to healthcare, including gender affirming care, and so forth. The discourse of eradicating transgenderism is is what leads to the behavioral violence of massacres of LGBTQ people like that uh, of the Pulse Club massacre in Orlando or Club Q in Colorado Springs recently, or um, in the case of racist rhetoric and policies, the racial segregation that allowed for white supremacists to massacre black, black people right here in Buffalo last year. Um, so in addition to kind of understanding and seeing the relationship between behavioral violence and structural violence, I also want to talk about um, the need to be critical about how behavioral violence and data related to it is used to also justify structural violence, such as how crime statistics are used to increase police surveillance and violence that then lead to, you know, racial disparities, for example, in police killings. So um, how can we get involved in, in addressing these issues or talking about these issues. Um, I think um, one key thing is that to address violence at its roots, we need to denormalize both behavioral violence and structural violence and become more sensitized to both. In order to address a problem, we have to recognize that there is a problem. And if we've normalized something, we do not recognize it as an issue, but rather a factor of, of society. But we want to see violence. We need to see violence as both a fact and a problem that needs to be addressed. So that's one thing I want to I I want to say. Um, I think we also, as people in public health, as professionals of public health and students of public health, we need structural solutions like social welfare programs that work to eliminate the social economic inequalities or what I've described as structural violence. That programs like this have shown to reduce behavioral and community violence. Um, and other forms of violence it might produce, right? So we need um, positive programs, programs that contribute to building up rather than breaking down programs, social welfare programs that help eliminate um, social economic inequalities um, can then help address violence that are produced by these forms of structural violence. We also need to eliminate laws that dehumanize marginalized groups such as these anti-LGBTQ bills that are being proposed and implemented um, of laws that dehumanize, minoritize racial and ethnic groups, such as, you know, anti-immigration laws, the violence at the border, um, laws that um, incarcerate people for, uh, you know, acts that are a product of needing to survive, right? So petty crimes, et cetera. Um, we need to change laws like that um, and move funding from criminalization to funding to social programs that help people thrive and help communities thrive, right? So. Um, you know, I think these are some of the examples of how we can actually shift our focus from um, implementing uh, structural violent policies to investing in um, policies that bring resources, bring funding um, into our communities to help folks um, meet their needs and, and thrive and, um, and so forth. So uh, those are kind of the two things I think we need to do to address the issues and ways that we can get involved kind of advocating um, for um, policies like these. Thank you so much um, and happy National Public Health Week.